Good evening. My name is Moazez Riordan. I'm the project manager for the proposed signal and safety improvements at Interchange 127 Newton Corner project, which will be presented today. I work in the project management section at the Massachusetts Department of Transportation's Highway Division headquarters in Boston. Welcome to our virtual public outreach workshop meeting. The purpose of this meeting is to inform the public of the work that has been completed, solicit input from the public for the next meeting, and finally, next steps. The format of this meeting is same as the last one. We will present information and solicit feedback with series of poll questions, and then we'll open the meeting to comment session towards the end of the meeting. I will now introduce Kayla Sousa and Leah Grotstein, who are the producers and facilitators of this hearing. Thank you. My name is Kayla, and I am one of the MassDOT producers this evening, providing tech support and facilitating questions alongside Leah Grotstein. Let me take a moment to go over some Zoom basics. If you need to call into the meeting, you can call 646-931-3860 and use webinar ID 873-9997-5601. Zoom tech support can be reached at 1-888-799-9666. On the bottom left, you can find your audio controls. The chat function is disabled for this meeting, so please direct your written questions to the Q&A box. You can type questions at any time, and we will answer them at the end of the presentation where we will also allow participants to ask questions verbally. Please note that while Zoom provides automatic closed captions, they may not be entirely accurate. I would like to let everyone know that this public meeting is being recorded. All parts of public meetings are public records, so MassDOT can retain and distribute all parts of this meeting. If you type a question or ask one verbally, know that you'll be a part of the record so please use both functions for project-related business only. If you're not comfortable being included in those types of records, you can choose to just listen in today or excuse yourself from the hearing entirely. Again, we will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. All questions and comments are welcome. However, please refrain from any disrespectful comments. Lastly, a survey will pop up at the end of this meeting. Please take the time to answer it. Your feedback is important to us. Here's a quick review of how to make comments during this meeting. If you wish to make a comment during the presentation portion of the meeting using the Q&A feature, select the Q plus A button at the bottom of your screen and type your comment. At the end of the meeting, we will open up for comments. At that time, if you wish to make a comment verbally, select the raise hand button to send a signal to our moderator that you'd like to speak. At the appropriate time, the moderator will call on you and unmute you. If you are dialing in via telephone, you may dial star nine to raise your hand. For the benefit of everyone, please kindly limit your comments to one comment at a time, even if written. If speaking, please also limit to one comment and limit your time to two minutes. If you have another comment, simply raise your hand again after you are done the first time or type in a second comment. On your screen now is the MassDOT Diversity and Civil Rights Statement. If you are interested in learning more about our diversity and civil rights policies and how they affect our public meetings and hearings, please contact the Office of Diversity and Civil Rights. I will now hand things back over to our project manager, MG. Thank you. Before getting into project details, I'd like to introduce the project team and panelists for tonight's presentation. Joining me here are Mark Abbott, Joe Dusset, Emil Vassarov from District 6, Mark Hicks from Mass, Mass UT right away, Mass UT producers Kayla Sosa and Leah Grotstein, Don Cook, Christine Treasures, Mark Dunlow, and Valerie Lanhart from VHP Mass UT's design consultant for this project. The notice of this workshop appeared in the Boston Globe on October 10, 2023 and October 17, 2023. The notice and the flyer 
were posted on MassDOT website as well as MassDOT social media. This slide presents this evening's meeting agenda. As mentioned earlier, there will be a 40-45 minutes uh, formal presentation. Then we will open the meeting to a public comment session. The meeting duration time in the public notice indicated that the meeting is slated to end at 7.30, but we can stay a little later to make sure that as many people as possible have had time to provide comments. And as mentioned earlier, we will be recording this meeting. In a few days, the meeting will then be posted to the project webpage on MassDOT website. We will keep the comment period open for 10 days after the recording is posted. Links to the project's website webpage will be provided at the end of tonight's presentation. The next few slides are the same from the pre previous public meeting, but I am providing a quick overview of the project for any people who are attending tonight that did not get to participate in or attend the last meeting. The project limits for this project are Washington Street from Church Street from the west to Center Street in the east, Center Avenue from Church Street at the west to the I-90 eastbound on ramp. The limits also include a portion of Church Street, Center Street, Park Street, and St. James Street. The Newton Corner Rotary is an unusual interchange in that the interstate ramp system is fully and directly integrated into the local roadway system. The area is in a dense urban commercial and residential environment. Often the eastbound traffic on the off-ramp backs up onto I-90 for sometimes a mile, including on Saturdays. This backup on I-90 creates significant congestion and safety concerns along the Mass Turnpike. Newton Corner Rotary contains many elements that may be confusing to a motorist. The fact that a significant number of ramps, streets, enter, exit the Rotary creates multiple short weave conditions between entering traffic and circulating traffic. The short weave segments require drivers to make quick decisions in order to determine which lane they should use, as well as the need to quickly switch, switch lanes in order to continue through the rotary or to exit it. With the confusing geometry and weaving, there are safety concerns and significant number of crashes. There's a lack of multimodal accommodation as well. As part of this project, the consultant VHB, along with MassDOT and the city, will complete an alternatives analysis for Newton Corner, developing and evaluating options for modifications to traffic control and roadway configuration to address safety and operational issues for all users. Once midterm improvements have been identified, the city of Newton will work with MassDOT and the MPO to identify a funding source for the improvements and begin the design process. Regarding the short term or immediate improvements, we heard you. MassDOT and the city of Newton will be implementing and monitoring improvements in 2024. Development of long-term alternatives that could include major geometric circulation or infrastructure modifications, removal of existing or proposal of new bridges, I-90 overpasses, significant modifications of I-90 or significant changes to right-of-way or existing structures are not included as part of the scope of work. But MassDOT will be starting the long-term planning study in the next few months that will consider long-term changes to improve safety, congestion, mobility, and access. There will be a public involvement process. Since our last public meeting in March, the design team along with MassDOT and the city have been developing numerous alternatives, which were evaluated and vetted by the design team. 
Not all the alternatives will be presented tonight. The alternatives that the entire team believe encompass the overall goals of the project will be presented tonight. We will then ask for initial feedback through a series of poll questions. I would like to take a moment and frame the process we intend to use for this project. We have completed tasks one through four, and tonight is the start of summary of task four. We will use the information gathered tonight to continue to evaluate and develop the preferred alternative. The study team will then come back to this coming winter to present the results of the evaluation for public comment before the study is finalized. We would like to ask our first poll question at this point. Poll question number one reads, have you attended any of the previous public meetings and workshops for Newton Corner? Option one is yes, I have attended at least one previous meeting. Option two, yes, I have attended both meetings. And no, this is my first meeting. We have close to full participation, 86%. Seems like people are um, done answering that one. So we're going to end the poll and share the results. Okay, uh, now Christine with VHB will go over the project goals and previous public feedback. Thank you, Kayla. I will now go over the project goals. Based on collaboration with the project team, we've established a set of six project goals and objectives for this project that you see on your screen right here. As you will see from our previous public engagement results I'm about to show you, Newton Corner serves travelers of many different transportation modes and priorities. Many of these goals represent somewhat conflicting priorities. During alternative development for this project, we strove for concepts that met as many of these goals as possible with a focus on safety, improving congestion and multimodal accommodations. The alternatives you'll see presented here tonight have been evaluated on how well they address the six goals and objectives established for this project. I will now take some time to discuss the public feedback that we've received in the past. The public workshop we held last fall included a 45 minute breakout session divided into 10 groups. Facilitators from both MassDOT and VHB displayed an aerial map of the project area to encourage discussion and pinpoint the locations of, of specific comments. Feedback and comments were noted on the map by facilitators, which included comments general and also specific to location and or modes. An example map with notes is shown on this slide. We received a lot of feedback during these sessions. Most participants shared comments generally indicating that for all modes, the study area is not functioning well. It presents safety hazards for all who travel through and that they prefer to avoid traveling they prefer to avoid traveling through the area whenever possible. Other general comments that we received was that the area is stressful, confusing, patterns result in cut through traffic into quiet neighborhood streets, and maintenance issues such as ponding or snow removal impact safety for all users. There were also many location specific comments. The I-90 ramps, especially the eastbound off ramp was the top location discussed. It was noted that this ramp seemingly is always backed up. There's confusion on how many lanes the off ramp should be and speeds coming off of the I-90 mainline to the ramp was noted as a safety concern. Another frequently discussed location was the south side of Washington Street. Specific comments note that there was a lot of driver confusion in this section, which causes lane changes and issues with yielding. Transit along this section was also noted as a focus area. During the first public workshop, the study team asked a series of poll questions. As shown in the chart on the left, we heard that travel through Newton Corner is multimodal. While many people who attended the meeting drove, folks also use other modes like walking, bicycling, and taking transit. 
In the breakout rooms, participants commented on issues related to specific modes and often the interaction between several modes. For example, some participants indicated that unsafe conditions or a lack of accommodations deterred them from walking through the area, leading them to drive instead. We also heard that the biggest transportation concern is related to safety, followed by vehicle congestion and traffic, shown in the chart on the right. These views were discussed in more detail in those breakout rooms, where there many reported backups impacting traffic operations and congestion. There were requests for redesigning the off ramps to have two lanes, to have two lanes instead of one lane for more storage. Regarding safety, the breakout room discussions indicated that there are challenges for all modes, not just drivers. We'd like to gauge our audience here tonight and ask that same poll question we asked back last fall. Um, and ask which modes of transportation you utilize to travel through Newton Corner. We're going to leave this one open again just for a minute to give everyone a chance to answer. So this is a, a multiple choice question. I'll just read it again or select all that apply rather. Uh, what are your modes of travel through Newton Corner? And the options are bicycling, walking, running, the MBTA bus, driving, and other shuttle bus or carpool options. Looks like we already have 86% um, participation again, getting up to 90. Great, so I think we're good with this poll question, Christine, Leah, if you wanna end it. Thank you. In our previous meeting, we asked you about the six study goals shown on this slide. The goals are to maintain property access and parking issues, improve land use and placemaking, improve transit, improve traffic operations and reduce congestion, expand multimodal infrastructure, and to enhance safety. Meeting participants were asked to rank these study goals in order of importance, with one being the most important and six being the least important. As you can see on the screen, enhancing safety, again, rose to the top with the most number one votes. Improving traffic operations and reducing congestion, expanding multimodal infrastructure, and improving transit were also highly ranked. The study team used these responses to evaluate the various alternatives that were developed after the previous meetings to help reduce the number of alternatives. And now we'd like to ask you to rank these project goals again at this point in the project to see if priorities have remained the same or shifted at all. So for poll question number three, you should be able to rank the project goals that were discussed in the past in order of importance to you. And so one is most important, and then it's a sliding scale down to six, which is least important. And so the six goals are enhance safety, improve traffic operations and reduce congestion, improve transit, expand multimodal infrastructure, property access and parking issues, and land use and placemaking. Looks like we only have about 10% participation. We've gotten up to 90 with our past questions. So we'll give this one a minute, a little trickier to navigate. Um, also like to note that Zoom may limit how many of the numbers that you see. And so if you scroll with your mouse, you should be able to see all of the numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then I believe if you click and drag, you'll be able to see all of the goals. So there's some limitations in Zoom and hopefully everyone is working that out all right. We're at about 55% participation. Still seeing some answers. Maybe we'll leave that one open, but kind of keep talking. Christine, if you'd like to go over the various alternatives that have been developed. Thank you, Kayla. We'll now move into the alternatives that were developed for this project, beginning with how the project area was organized and broken out. Our project focus and study area is the entirety of Newton Corner, but for alternative development, we broke Newton Corner up into four quadrants, each encompassing a major intersection and its intersecting streets. 
As previously mentioned, the alternatives that are being presented tonight represent months of concept development and first level screening, involving coordination with MassDOT and the City of Newton. There are many concepts considered and analyzed, including the ones you will see tonight, but not all of them have been carried forward, as not all were determined by the team to meet the goals of the project. Over the next several slides, I'll show you several concepts and discuss how they modify existing conditions and ask for audience feedback on which concepts you feel met best meet the goals of the project. We'll start in the Northeast Quadrant and move counterclockwise, finishing with the Southeast Quadrant. As promised, we're starting in the Northeast Quadrant. And before I dive into the concept you see on the screen, I want to mention that this quadrant was challenging and there weren't a lot of midterm options available due to right of way, due to right -of -way restrictions and proximity of buildings to the roadways. As mentioned earlier, there's a long-term planning study that will be kicking off soon, but options are limited for short to midterm solutions. Jumping into this concept, concept A, it's fairly similar to the existing condition with a couple notable differences. The I-90 westbound on-ramp, which is a single lane only today, has been formalized into two lanes. To allow for these two lanes to head southbound onto the ramp from Center Street, minor widening is proposed into the existing median island between Galen Street northbound and southbound directions, and into the Bell Tower Park near the ramp. This widening also allows for the right turn lane from Center Street southbound to be maintained on to Washington Street. The on-ramp does have a pinch point at the existing bridge over the railroad tracks, so the lanes do need to merge back into one lane as you head towards I-90. Wider median islands are proposed between the I-90 westbound off-ramp and Charles Bank Road, as well as on the Washington Street Bridge, where traffic splits to head either westbound on Washington or onto the westbound on-ramp. Widening the median islands allows for new green space and new pedestrian movements and is achieved by widening into that bell tower park, as well as by shifting the off ramp right turn lane closer to the through lanes within the still within the existing roadway footprint. This is an improvement over the existing condition where the closest Washington Street crossing is at Bacon Street, and it also provides a shorter and safer crossing towards Charles Bank. Other than the changes I just discussed, this quadrant matches the existing condition in terms of pedestrian and vehicular movements. Concept B shown here and concept C, which we will see in a moment, are both modifications to a portion of concept A. Concept B and C present alternatives to that center street southbound movement onto Washington Street with, with the rest of the concepts is identical to concept A. In concept B, that right turn movement is modified such that the lane is widened into the existing crosswalk to allow for a vehicle right turn lane and a bus only right turn lane, in addition to the two through lanes onto the ramp in concept A. In concept C, the right turn movement is again modified, again widening into the existing sidewalk to allow for new pedestrian crossings across the entire southbound approach. Additional space is available for both both bus and vehicle turn lanes, but as you can see on the screen, the bus lane doesn't open up until after the crosswalk. The new crosswalks provide a direct pedestrian connection for the northwest corner of this intersection that doesn't currently exist. In addition to what was discussed for each of these three concepts, there will also be signal timing improvements for all concepts, which will improve safety and vehicle queuing. The table you see here compares each concept for this quadrant against the project goals. So as a quick reminder, the project goals are as follows, in order of most to least highly ranked by the public. Enhancing safety, improving traffic and reducing congestion, improving transit, expanding multimodal infrastructure, property access and parking, and land use and placemaking. For each goal and concept, the impact, positive, neutral, or negative, is noted. The legend on the right no illustrates that the positive impact is denoted as a green check, a neutral or no impact is a black circle, and a negative impact is a red X. When two or more concepts both have a positive impact for a goal, but one concept is expected to have a greater positive impact than the other, two green checks are shown as a tiebreaker. I will give folks a minute to look over this comparison of concepts before we move on to the polling question.
And now, Kayla, I think we can dive into the polling question for this location. Perfect. So polling question number four asks, based on the information presented, which alternative, concept A, B, or C, best meets the goals of the project? Concept A is your first choice, B is the second choice, and C is the third choice. We'll give this a minute. Looks like we're at about 30% participation. Really appreciate everyone's feedback. Picking up towards 60%. This is great. Okay, we're at about 70% participation. Looks like it's kind of holding steady. Um, so maybe we can keep the poll open for just a few more seconds, but Christine would like to move on with that. Makes sense. Okay. Thank you, Kayla. Next up is the Northwest Quadrant, where in the focus of this quadrant is the intersection of Washington Street eastbound and westbound, their approaches, and how they merge onto the onto the Center Ave Bridge. Sorry. Concept A, shown on your screen, modifies the existing condition in a couple of ways. On the west side of the intersection, Washington is maintained as a two-way street but the eastbound approach merges into a single lane prior to turning onto the bridge. On the east side of the intersection, Washington westbound will remain as it is under the existing condition with three westbound lanes headed towards the intersection. Similar to existing conditions, traffic from both the east side and the west side will funnel into three lanes headed southbound on the bridge. For Washington Street westbound traffic that stays straight when tra tra traveling past the bridge, the existing lanes are reduced from two lanes to one until the west side of the intersection, which opens up additional space that could be used for a bike lane. Traffic approaching the bridge from all directions would now be controlled with a new traffic signal, rather than the existing condition where the Washington Street eastbound traffic yields to the westbound traffic. The signalization is expected to improve safety and reduce driver confusion by eliminating the vehicular weave onto the bridge. New pedestrian crossings are proposed across the traffic lanes on both approaches headed onto the bridge and across Washington Street at Thornton Street. And a new shared use path for pedestrians and bicyclists is proposed on the south side of Washington Street. The shared use path would extend onto the west side of the bridge. Under existing conditions, the closest pedestrian crossings across Washington Street are at Church Street and between Channing Street and Peabody Street. And this concept improves on the existing condition by providing a crossing that is closer to the intersection and shorter in length. On Washington Street eastbound, where two lanes merge into one, the existing on-street parking on the south side of the roadway will need to be evaluated, as it might be difficult for drivers to maneuver into and out of those on-street parking spaces while also merging from two lanes into one. Concept B that you see now is similar to concept A with the following differences. Two lanes are now maintained on the Washington Street eastbound approach as you head onto the bridge. And to accommodate the second lane, the shared use path is a bit narrower on the south side of Washington Street than it was in concept A. Providing two eastbound lanes creates more space for vehicles to queue and approximately halves the anticipated queue lengths when the light is red as compared to concept A and it eliminates concepts A's merge into one lane. Similar to the first quadrant we, took a, we already took a look at, the table you see here compares the two Northwest Quadrant concepts against each project goal. I'll give folks a minute to look over this comparison of concepts before we move into a polling question for this location. All right, I think we can dive into our poll question for the Northwest Quadrant now, Kayla. Perfect. So poll question number five is based on the information presented, which alternative, concept A or concept B, 
best meets the goals of the project. So both of the concepts are shown here. We'll just give folks a minute. Looks like we're already at 60% participation, which is great. Again, this is for the uh, Northwest Quadrant, concept A, signal control with one lane eastbound, concept B, signal control with two lanes eastbound. Okay, we're at 75%, pretty steady there. So Christine, I think we're ready to look at the next section. Thanks, I'm actually gonna turn it over to Matt Duranlo to speak about the next two quadrants. Thanks, Christine and Kayla. So um, I'm Matt Duranlo with VHB, uh, the mobility lead, and I'll be talking about the last two quadrants um, today, tonight at Newton Corner. Um, so here uh, we're moving on to the Southwest quadrant. Um, so the first quadrant you see on your screen um, is concept A. Um, and so this modifies the existing conditions in a couple ways uh, for concept A. Um, shown here, we have two lanes coming off the bridge on Washington, Washington Street eastbound, which is also referred to as Center Avenue um, in this section. Um, and those two lanes stay permanently separated from ramp, ramp traffic with a raised median that extends all the way to the Center Street intersection. Um, the two lanes um, would approach the intersection with one through lane and one right turn lane approaching Center Street. Um, the I-90 eastbound off-ramp traffic would then come off the highway as one lane, as in the existing conditions, but would open up to two lanes, again, with one through lane and one right turn lane. Also, rather than a stop sign at the top of the ramp, as in the existing conditions, ramp traffic would only stop when there is a pedestrian uh, crossing the new crosswalk that's proposed there. Um, all of new traffic signal is proposed at the Center Street intersection, um, which is indicated on the screen by the little uh, red triangles. Those are roughly where the signal heads would go for the new uh, traffic signals. Um, and so as part of the new traffic signal, the through lanes would go at the same time on the off ramp and on the Center Ave Washington uh, eastbound approach. Um, and then the northern right turn lane would progress when the southern off ramp lanes have a red light. Um, a total of four lanes are proposed on the approaching uh, eastbound eastbound approach to the Center Street, Center Street intersection, um, as in the existing condition, uh, two lanes on each side of the median. Um, but the, as noted, they're separated by the median. Um, the Center Street northbound approach to Washington Street right turn would be widened from two lane from one lane to two lanes, um, and those right turns would both be placed under signal control as well. Um, a new pedestrian crossing is proposed across the I-90 eastbound off-ramp um, and the existing crossing across Washington eastbound is proposed to be shifted slightly to the east uh, into roughly that median that's being proposed to be constructed there. Um, a new shared use path would be proposed on the west side of the bridge, um, taking advantage of that some additional space that opens up um, and with the connection that would then go down to Richardson, Richardson Street um, on the south side. Um, the shared use path would then continue on the east side of the of the Center Street intersection on the southern side of Washington Street. Um, and the shared use path would be for both pedestrians and for bicyclists. Um, overall, this concept improves safety by physically separating traffic coming off the bridge from the off-ramp traffic, um, thereby removing the existing weave, um, and by placing all movements under signalized control at the Center Street intersection. Uh, by shifting the stop bar forward from the existing stop location on the ramp, um, additional space is created, which improves queuing. Uh, in most cases, the queue is expected to be contained within the ramp. And in addition to the extra space, the traffic signal will be equipped with queue detection, which will prioritize traffic flow from the off ramp um, if the queue starts to spill back onto the I-90 main line. All right, and then now uh, concept B for this quadrant. Um, Starting again, coming across the bridge, there are uh, three lanes proposed to come off the bridge as in the existing condition, but one of those two lanes would be signed ahead of time for a right turn approaching the Center Street intersection. Um, the I-90 eastbound off-ramp is proposed to be widened from one lane to two lanes, um, and the two lanes from the ramp and the three lanes from the bridge would be controlled with a new traffic signal just after the bridge, again, indicated by those red triangles. Traffic then heading to the Center Street intersection would continue as three lanes as opposed to the existing four lanes with two through lanes and one right turn lane. 
Uh, the new signals near the bridge would improve safety by controlling traffic patterns and by eliminating the weave between the ramp and the bridge traffic. Um, and the second lane on the off ramp would provide additional space for vehicles to queue at the light. So again, that in most cases, the queue would not spill back onto I-90. Um, in addition to the extra space, this traffic signal would also be equipped with queue detection as it would be in concept A. Uh, the center street northbound approach on the right side of the screen uh, remains largely the same as existing. However, a sidewalk level bike lane is proposed on the east side of center street um, uh, by narrowing the travel lane a little bit um, and new and updated traffic signals are proposed. Um, a new pedestrian crossings is proposed across the south side of the bridge and the I-90 eastbound off-ramp at the location of the new signal. Um, and similar to concept A, the crossing at Center Street is proposed to be shifted slightly to the east. Um, again, also as shown in concept A, a showed use path is proposed on the west side of the bridge uh, for pedestrian and bicyclists, uh, providing bike connections through here uh, with a connection down to Richardson Street. But unlike in concept A, um, because we're able to reduce the cross section from four lanes to three lanes on um, Center Avenue there, um, this concept allows for the showed use path to extend from the ramp crossing to the Center Street intersection. Um, this is a benefit over concept A as it's so as this will provide a continuous bicycle connection along the south side of the roadway there. Um, and now, as with the previous two quadrants we looked at, um, we're going to show a table that, again, compares this of the two concepts uh, as they relate to each of the project goals. Um, and I'll give you guys a couple of minutes to, again, look at this. And great, and with that, I think we can move on to our uh, poll question for this concept here, this quadrant here. Okay, so for the Southwest quadrant, this is poll question number six. Based on the information presented, which alternative, concept A or concept B, best meets the goals of the project? And so concept A, as shown, is the off-ramp divided to the signal at Center Street. And concept B is a two-lane off-ramp with signal control. Apologies to everyone for going off script, but I did see a clarifying question in the Q&A that maybe it would be good to answer while we keep this poll open. Someone was asking if the shared use path was raised or level with the street in this concept. Uh, the shared use path. Um, actually, I'll refer to um, Kristen on our team to answer this one. Thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. I'm Kristen with VHB. Um, and yes, typically the shared use path would be raised at above the roadway level. Thanks so much. I think that's going to help people answer the poll. Seems like we have 72% participation. I don't see anyone else answering. I think we are ready to move on to the next section. Great, thanks, Kayla. Um, I also just wanted to do a reminder before we do this final, um, all of these concepts will be posted on the project website after the meeting, um, and everyone will have a chance to review these farther in depth. Um, as I know, we're going uh, pretty quickly through all this. Um, we have a lot of great information we're trying to share with you guys today, so trying to be able to show it all. Um, so now we're going to move on to the final quadrant, uh, which is the southeast quadrant. Um, and I want to mention that for this quadrant, um, we're a little bit more flexible with the other than the other quadrants in terms of options due to the wider right away. Um, so we actually have four different concepts we're going to show tonight. Um, the first two co concepts are uh, signalized concepts, um, and then we're going to have a poll question for you guys to be able to compare the two signalized concepts, um, and then we're going to present two concepts that introduce roundabouts um, at this area. Um, and then we'll, again, we'll have a poll question for you guys to compare the two roundabout options. Um, and then finally, we'll wrap up this quadrant by comparing a, a generic signalized intersection option uh, with a generic roundabout option. Um, and then again, we'll ask the audience to compare these two types of intersections. Um, so the concept on your screen is the first of four options, uh, the first of the two signalized options, um, and it has the following changes. Um, so coming from the west, on the far left side of the screen, we have four lanes of traffic on Washington Street approaching the intersection. Um, 
coming uh, approaching the quadrant. Coming into the quadrant, uh, we have two left turn lanes and uh, two through lanes. Uh, both left turn lanes head towards the bridge. However, the traffic in the far left lane will be signed towards I-90 westbound. It'll be physically separated from the second left turn lane by a median. Um, and that tra lane will be for traffic heading towards both Washington Street westbound, heading towards West Newton, and traffic towards Center Street and Galen Street northbound, heading up into Watertown. Um, aside from the signalized pedestrian crossing, um, the left turn lane going towards I-90 westbound off-ramp will be, the westbound on-ramp, sorry, um, will be free flow uh, coming around the corner, while the other left turn lane that's median separated um, will be under signal control opposite the vehicle movements that are coming from the seat, coming from the east and coming from the south. Um, this will help to reduce the weave on the bridge and to improve safety by controlling vehicle movements as they are entering the bridge. Um, now continuing eastbound on Washington Street, um, once the left turn lanes drop off, Washington Street eastbound widens with the existing, within the existing roadway footprint and matches um, the existing condition heading east towards Park Street and the I-90 eastbound ramp. Um, in the northbound and westbound directions on Park Street, Washington Street, northbound and St. James Street, traffic control is maintained, but we'll have new traffic signals um, and the existing geometry will be improved uh, heading onto the bridge uh, with a narrower uh, cross section versus the existing three lane approach um, where um, right where the cursor is showing. Um, in addition to the new traffic signals, um, this will help reduce the weave onto the bridge, um, improving safety as all of those three movements coming together will be signal controlled, um, except for the far left lane, as I mentioned previously. Uh, pedestrian crossings um, are proposed in roughly the same location as today's crossings, which are located just west of the bridge with that pedestrian signal and at the Park Street and Washington Street intersections. Uh, the sidewalk on the south side of Washington Street here is proposed to be widened into a shared use path to allow for both bicycles and pedestrian movements and would connect to the um, shared use path in the previous quadrant that I shared. Um, additional space for the shared use path is created within the existing roadway by shifting the Washington Street lanes north and into the existing meeting islands and by reducing the landscaping between the roadway and the existing sidewalk. Um, the proposed median island shift around slightly in size and location from existing, and by redoing the median islands, even with reductions in size, it will create opportunities for new and additional green space. And now going on to the next quad the next concept for this quadrant. Um, as similar in the previous concepts, um, this will have four lanes of wash traffic from Washington Street West approaching the quadrant with two left turn lanes and two through lanes. However, this time, the left turn lanes both head towards the bridge and are no longer separated by a median and will both be controlled by a new traffic signal. Um, as with the previous concept, the left turn lanes will be signed ahead of time to point drivers in the direction of either the I-90 westbound on-ramp from the far left lane or for Washington Street westbound or Center Street, Galen Street northbound from the second left turn lane. Um, all traffic approaching the bridge now will be signal controlled with that left turn movement and then with drivers coming northbound and um, westbound, um, which will help to improve safety and reduce driver confusion by eliminating the weave. Now continuing um, eastbound again on Washington Street, once the left turn lanes drop off, Washington Street will hold the narrower three lane roadway section, um, which will provide space for a wider raised center island until the Park Street intersection. Um, east of Park Street, Washington Street will match the existing three lane condition. Um, again, in the northbound and westbound directions on Park Street, Washington Street northbound and St. James Street, uh, the ex existing conditions are generally maintained. Um, however, as with in concept A1, the existing geometry and safety will be improved by heading onto the bridge um, with the narrow, narrower approach. Um, under this concept, the two existing pedestrian crossings west of the bridge and at Park Street are consolidated to cross at the Park Street signal, um, and then we'll cross through a large median island that allows for more green space. Um, then there'll be two crossings there um, on the left side and the right side um, of the foot of the bridge um, with the new traffic signals there. Um, also, as in concept A1, um, a shared use path is proposed on the south side of Washington Street um, to provide for pedestrian and bicycle movements through this area. All right, and then now, as similar to the last couple of concepts, um, we'll look at this quick table um, to show how these two different uh, concepts relate to the different project goals. And I'll give folks a minute to look this over, and then we'll move into the polling question.
Great. And I think with that, um, I'll hand it off to Kayla for the polling question. So for this question, we're looking at the two signalized alternatives for the southeast quadrant. Poll question number seven asks, based on the information presented, which signalized alternative, concept A1 or concept A2, best meets the goals of the project? As Matt describes, concept A1 is our signal control with divided eastbound left turns, and concept A2 is the signal control with combined eastbound left turns. I think I might have said that wrong. A1 is divided eastbound left turns. A2 is the combined eastbound left turns. That's correct, yep. <laughs> Thanks, Kayla. We'll leave this up for a minute. About 70% participation, which is pretty in line with the other concepts, but uh, we'll give, give this just a few more seconds, I think, before we move on. Great, Matt. Let's uh, see some roundabouts. Sounds good. Um, and so so now um, I'm going to present the last two uh, pair of options. Um, and again, this is for the southeast quadrant again. Um, and so since we just showed the two signalized options, now I'm going to show two roundabout options that we looked at. Um, so this first concept, concept B1, um, introduces a bigger change to the existing condition than the signalized concepts um, by proposing roundabouts, one at the Park Street intersection um, and one at the Washington Street northbound slash St. James Street intersection. Um, in general, uh, roundabouts are safer than signalized intersections as they reduce the number of conflict points um, and they slow vehicles down approaching the intersection. Um, in this concept, the two roundabouts are fed by the two roundabouts are fed. Sorry, in this concept, the roundabouts are fed by two eastbound Washington Street lanes and two northbound lanes from Park Street and from Washington Street. Um, in the westbound direction, a single lane will approach from St. James Street, um, as similar to the existing conditions with the signals. Uh, two lanes from Washington Street eastbound and westbound will um, then circulate around the roundabout as shown there. Um, to the On the left side of the screen, um, similar to the previous concepts, two lanes will come from Washington Street going, co coming from the west um, and will be signalized with two lanes coming out of the roundabout um, to provide controlled entry into the bridge. Um, and again, pedestrian crossings will be provided across those approaches. Um, the existing pedestrian crossings across Washington Street at Park and Washington Northbound here are consolidated into one signalized crossing uh, between the roundabouts, um, and that'll be signal controlled uh, for when a pedestrian is waiting to cross the, cross the, the roadway. Um, there's also a shared use path connection near the bridge, um, as I just mentioned, with those two new crossings, um, and then a large median island, which will open up additional room for green space. Um, shared use paths for pedestrians and cyclists are proposed here on both sides of Washington Street with this concept um, as, as shown on the screen. Um, it is anticipated, however, that this concept would impact at least one property on the south side of Washington Street um, in, between Was in between Park Street and Washington Northbound due to the larger right-of-way needed for a roundabout. Um, and this, the roundabouts will also cause longer queuing on side streets as compared to the signalized concepts. Um, and now the final concept we're going to show tonight, um, concept B2. Um, this one here is uh, pretty similar to the previous concept that I just shown, with the only difference being that in the westbound direction, um, instead of having two through lanes, it's narrowed down to one through lane. Um, this also makes it so that coming up Washington Street northbound, it's one left turn lane heading on to the roundabout, and then one right turn lane going on to the I-90 eastbound ramp. Um, in this concept, the single lane is proposed rather than two lanes in order to shift the roundabout slightly north and to minimize the impacts to the property, uh, to, in order to minimize property impacts to the south. Um, however, uh, th this concept will have a uh, longer queuing than I mentioned in concept B1 due to the single lane um, going circulating through the roundabout. Um, and with that, um, I'll show the, now again, the table comparing the um, different goals and how they relate to the roundabout concepts. And I'll pass it off to Kayla for our second to last poll question of the night.
Thanks, Matt. So for poll question number eight, we're asking, based on the information presented, which roundabout alternative, concept B1 or concept B2, best meets the goals of the project? And so this is the roundabout alternatives at the southeast quadrant. Concept B1 is the roundabouts with two lanes westbound. Concept B2, roundabouts with one lane westbound. So again, we'll leave this up on the screen for folks to see while they answer the poll. We're at about 50% participation. There's some poll fatigue, I understand, but we definitely appreciate all the feedback. This has been great. We are up to about 60%. Let's give this another minute. At 60%, I think we're good to close the poll and move on. Great, thanks, Kayla. Um, and so now that we've compared two specific signalized options and two specific roundabout options, and, um, we're presenting a comparison of a generic signalized intersection um, and a generic roundabout intersection. Um, so again, this is just comparing generally how a traffic signal concept and a roundabout concept, not specifically the two concepts for each um, alternative that we just showed. Um, so again, spend a minute looking over this alternative, and then we'll ask one final poll question comparing uh, preference for generic traffic signal versus a roundabout. Great, and I think with that, we can ask the final poll question. All right, last poll question. So based on the information presented, which alternative, a traffic signal or a roundabout best meets the goals of the project? And again, this is for the Southeast quadrant. We have a few of the concepts showing on the screen. I'm seeing a lot in the chat about um, if, whether or not there could be a third option. We're logging all the feedback that we're getting in the Q&A chat. Um, but these poll questions were really trying to understand the uh, the relative comparison between the alternatives that we're showing. And so if you don't want to answer a particular question, that's fine. Um, we're lacking all the feedback we're getting no matter how we get it. So thank you everyone for the participation. Um, looks like we're already at 70% and I think people are still kind of answering. So we'll give this a few seconds before we keep going. I think maybe in the interest of time, we just keep the poll question open um, just for a little bit longer, but continue with the presentation. Sounds good. Um, and with that, the alternatives are wrapped up and I'll hand it back to MG for the next steps. Thank you. I would like to take a moment to give you a status of the study, what we are do working on and the next steps after tonight. We are at step five tonight. We have already completed steps one through four. After tonight, we will take the information gathered tonight and start step six and further refine the, our analysis and alternatives and present the findings back to you in winter of 2024. At step eight, the study team will document the findings and purpose propose improvements for implementation. Step nine, will begin the design of the proposed improvements. At this time, the proposed improvements are unknown. We are still in early stages of project development and have not made any determinations. Like all mass DOT projects, right away will be considered and will follow the established process. The team will continue to inform the public as the design progresses. Now, I would like to turn the presentation over to Mark Hicks, representing MassDOT's Right-of-Way Bureau 
to discuss the right away procedures. Thank you, Mamzat. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Hicks, and I represent the right away bureau at Mass DOT. The right away bureau is responsible for acquiring all the necessary rights in private and public lands for the design, construction, and implementation of this project. Affected property owners will be contacted by personnel from the right away bureau or consultants representing Mass DOT. The procedures used must comply with state and federal regulations governing the acquisition process. Affected property owners' rights are protected under our Massachusetts general laws, primarily Chapter 79. If a project is receiving federal funds, the property owner's rights are further defined under the Title III of the Real Property Acts of 1970 as amended. Thank you very much. I will now hand it back to my colleague, Mazet. Thank you, Mark. In addition to the Mass DOT's outreach efforts outlined earlier, the notice and the flyer were posted on various locations. We would like to thank the City of Newton, Boston Metropolitan Planning Organization, Watertown RMV Service Center, Charles River Regional Chamber, Cooperative Metropolitan Ministries, Even Park at Newton Corner, and Benchmark Senior Living Center for distributing the flyer and notice for this hearing, for this meeting. Comments will be taken at this time. The comments will be addressed in the order they are received. Joining us tonight to assist in answering your questions are Mark Abbott, Joe Duchet, and Emil Vazarov from Mass DOT District 6, along with the VHB design team. Before we open up this forum to the general public, I would now like to ask if there are any public officials present and if they would like to speak. I request that those who would like to speak put your hand up, type your name and title in the Q&A box. In the meantime, I will now turn the floor over to Kayla and Leah to explain how to participate virtually in Q&A. Thank you, MV. So to ask a question verbally, click the raise hand icon and I will give you access to unmute your microphone. You'll need to unmute it yourself to be heard. If you prefer to type your question, you can click on the Q&A icon and write your question and Leah will read it out loud. For both methods, please ask only one question at a time so everyone gets a chance to participate. We will follow a two minute rule due to the number of participants that we have here tonight and please be respectful of each other's time. You can always raise your hand again or submit another question in the Q&A box to rejoin the queue. Uh, one final reminder that once you exit the Zoom webinar, a survey will automatically pop up. Please take a minute to fill it out. It's very short and your feedback is important to us. So as MG mentioned, before we begin the public Q&A, we do have a tradition of letting any public or elected officials offer their comments or questions first. Um, Leah, I don't know if you saw if there are any public or elected officials who would like to offer comment, if they would like to raise their hand. Actually, I see one for sure. Um, so it looks like we have Ward 1 Councillor uh, Maria Greenberg. So Councillor, I've given you access to unmute your microphone. Thank you, Kayla. Um, thank you to everyone. Um, uh, I was a little hesitant about this meeting, but now after seeing all the options, I'm getting pretty excited about this. Um, there seems to be real concrete solutions to the many problems of this uh, rotary. Uh, I think folks though will need a lot of time to digest all the options and solutions you've presented before us. Will all these slides be on the website so that we can um, review them in more detail? Uh, I can take this. Uh, yes. This presentation is being recorded. It will take us about a week to uh, get this on our project website. And it, we will keep them there 
10 business days for uh, comments. And after that, it will still stay there. However, the comments received within 10 business days after we post the uh, recording will be part of this meeting. And Ms. Reardon, will the slides be presented or, or is it just a recording? S yes, slides with the recording. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for all the hard work. Thank you. And Tracy, if you could just go to the next slide, because that's where the um, QR code is that would bring people to the website and then other comments and inquiries. Um, and I know we'll go over how to reach us in just a minute. But in the meantime, I'd like to give Josh Ostroff from the city of Newton a chance to speak. So, Josh, you should be able to unmute your microphone now. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? We Hello. can. So I appreciate all the hard work of the Mass DOT and VHB teams and um, this project, which is going on for uh, close to a year and a half now. Um, the city's planning and public works department have had the opportunity to work closely with you um, over the months. Um, and we have really appreciate the collaboration. Um, and I just note for the public's benefit that what we are seeing here, these uh, maybe 10 or so options um, is just a fraction of uh, all the different alternatives that were considered. So there's been a lot of winnowing down. If the project team could just speak to the process going forward, maybe you intend to do that. But so that people understand that over the next you know year or two, some of these will be implemented, but that others will take more time to pursue uh, design and arrange for funding, and that there will be considerable other opportunities for public comment. I think that might be helpful. Um, thank you very much. You're going to mute because there might be some background noise for him. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, I guess I can handle Josh's questions. I'm Mark Abbott from District 6 Traffic. Um, some of the next steps that are going forward that um, Josh alluded to is that hopefully at the beginning, MG mentioned that we're working with the city on um, trying to implement some short-term improvements um, this upcoming fiscal uh, year, um, probably starting the next construction season in 2024, um, which will include some of the um, basically replacing a lot of the outdated signal equipment and operations out there today. Um, beyond that, um, as far as what you saw today here um, for the alternatives, this will be going forward after the study's finalized um, with into a project development stage um, where it'll be made a project, um, design will be carried out, and then it'll be looking to go um, for different funding sources. And one of the funding so possible funding sources is the, um, the Boston Region MPO's TIP process, and that'll get turned. And then finally, the, the last part is what was mentioned um, previously was the, the long-term planning study, which I noticed a lot of the questions in the uh, chat um, kind of allude to why can't we look at other places and, instead of just focusing on Newton Corner. That study will, in fact, look at those type of options. It's not just concentrating on trying to look at long-term and long-term improvements of the corner, but looking at how traffic could be made better throughout the section of the turnpike where maybe different access points are uh, provided and, and things like that to um, lessen the impacts of traffic at Newton Corner. Hopefully that answers that question. If anybody else has any questions on that, please let, let us know. Thank you, Mark. I think we will get into some of the other raised hands before reading out some of the written questions. Um, so just a reminder about the, the two minute rule, we are past 7.30 and we have a lot of questions to get through. So um, please be mindful. So with that, I'm going to allow uh, Janet Sturman to talk. Janet, you can unmute your microphone now. Well, I think a couple of people asked the question and I'm asking the question as well. Why is none of the above one of the options? Because some people just didn't like, I just didn't answer some of the questions because I didn't like 
what you were putting out there as options. So that was my none of it. By no answer. It's like when people don't show up to vote, they don't vote because they don't feel like they're giving, no one's giving them a good option. Same thing. So that was one point I wanted to make. The other point I wanted to make is I've lived here over 30 years and I can tell you this much, putting signals up are not going to, in places where there aren't signals, are not going to improve traffic. It's just going to make it more of a cluster, you know what, than it is already. Putting bike lanes on that bridge is a death wish for people. I know people think bicycling is the way to go, but I will be counting the bodies as once you put them up and won't be saying I told you so. The last question, the real question I have is, who makes the final decision on this? Is it you people from the DOT, your unelected representatives, but your people that work for our government? Are you going to make the final decision on doing this? Or is there, how do we know when this is, this whole thing's going to be finalized? I guess I can take this. Uh, we are going to solicit input and the engineering team will work with the uh, city and the DOT and come up with a solution um, and we will come back and present to public again. I don't know if it answers your question. Mark, do you want to take it? Sure. Gee. So <clears throat> as far as the first part of your question is, um, well, excuse me, um, alluding to um, some of the options out there, it's, I guess, well, I kind of forgot what that was. Sorry about that. But the, um, the process and who decides will be it. It'll be taking comments that we receive here tonight, um, taking it back and looking at trying to develop a preferred alternative. And then once this becomes a project, it'll go through, again, it'll go through a public uh, process to develop a final design that will, what will be implemented out there. So it's not being decided tonight of, or in this, so what you're going to see out there is what you, what you saw tonight is what you're going to see out there. All right. Uh, thank you, Mark, and thanks for that question. I'm going to start us off on some of the typed questions now. Uh, so the first one that came up was from Rachel, who asked, uh, curious to know for how many years has queuing on I-90 eastbound been an issue? This was mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation. Um, and then someone else, uh, I believe a resident in the chat or in the Q&A, um, was saying that that you know she thinks it might have been um, it it seems newer and the business parks out at I ninety five and I four ninety five have developed more so the review reverse commute um, is more common um, so that's one possible answer but turning it over to the project team now uh, VHB team. Hi everyone, Christine Chiarkis from BHB. Um, I don't know if I can speak to the entire history of decades and decades, um, but you know the the I ninety offbound off ramp um, eastbound has been um, an issue for a very long time. Um, it used to be more prevalent during peak periods, um, and it seems to have gone to a little bit more of a spread over the course of the day. Um, but at least in my time in the last 16 years that I have been working and or living in this area and driving through it, um, it has been an issue, at least in peak periods during that time. Great. Thank you, Christine. Um, the next question comes from, or comment, comes from Catherine, but I've seen it a couple times in the Q&A and uh, I heard it just mentioned in the raised hands. So I'll just, you know, read it and then kind of ask generally. Um, Catherine says, bike lane in Northwest Quadrant Concept A, it's just inviting more problems slash risk of death. Bicyclists should avoid 
uh, the circle of death, not be encouraged to get in there. And yet we've had kind of similar comments for other uh, quadrants as well, that bicyclists should go around not be encouraged to be there with a bike lane. So that's the thing to address. Um, I'll take this one. I, first of all, thank you for your comment. Um, every single public input is is important. Um, we did hear a lot through our past public engagement, um, a desire from many people who bicycle or walk um, and have a desire to walk through the area and would like to find it more safer to do so. Um, so the intention here is, is certainly to provide additional options for all modes of transportation um, and by introducing things such as a shared use path um, and additional pedestrian crossings make it safer for all. Um, but we appreciate your comment um, and it certainly will be noted. Thank you. Um, and then we have, let's see. Um, I'm seeing a lot of questions and comments from the same people. So I'm just gonna look for one from somebody else just so we get to address a little bit of everyone's concerns. Here's one from Gregory, uh, a comment, paint is not infrastructure. Relying solely on stress drivers to obey paint can result in increased non-compliance and decreased safety. Painted bicycle gutters, uh, green paint alone, no protection, and painted crossings without signals or speed calming risk a crash. Thank you, Gregory, for that comment. Um, let me know if anyone wants to respond or otherwise I can just find the next uh, question. All right, I'm hoping uh, from the silence that we're just going to note that comment and move on. All right, uh, and then one more from Nate and then maybe we'll bounce back to a raised hand. Nate asks, uh, cars don't stop for traffic signals now on Center Street. How does either of these approaches affect that? Thank you for your question, Nate. Uh, I can chime in here. Um, yeah, so we acknowledge like a lot of the existing conditions um, are deficient and there's not a lot of great pedestrian accommodations out there. Um, so that's why we try to add um, a fair amount of uh, pedestrian crossings at traffic signals um, where vehicles will know to stop and go and that pedestrians will have uh, protected um, protected abilities to cross at uh, signalized crossings. Um, so where we're when we're starting to look at what different alternatives we could do, we tried to see like first and foremost where we could have pedestrians cross the roadway at traditional traffic signals so uh, so they're so they're protected Thank you um Kayla can I swap back to you for another mm -hmm. raised hand yeah sure so we're going to go to the next raised hand that's Catherine M so Catherine I've given you permission to unmute your microphone you can ask your question hi um just two quick questions. The first one was, is there a more kind of zoomed out analysis of bike traffic where the cyclists are trying to get to around the area that potentially they don't have to be mapped right through this intersection if they can easily transit where they're going, but avoid this? And then secondly, there was a, a concept in the Northwest uh, quadrant where you were kind of looking where should the merge happen for people traveling uh, eastbound, wondering if you had considered merging them uh, at the before the light on at Church Street. Uh, that way, they're slowing down; they get ready for the merge rather than trying to merge them while they're accelerating into the circle. Thank you. Thank you for both of your comments. Um, so I will start with the first one on the bicycle, um, I'll say desire lines. Um, as part of, I think, our second presentation um, back in March, we did look at existing, um, I'll say, bicycle infrastructure and desire lines and did a more regional map of what's available and kind of what the missing gaps are. Um, so we do have that available. I believe it is part of the slides and the records from the previous meeting. But if not, I'm sure we could find a way to circulate that and get it up on the project website as well. Um, 
And then in terms of the merging on the Washington Street eastbound as you're headed towards the bridge um, and asking if you could merge them even before um, at the Church Street, um, we actually did look at that option of having only one dedicated lane through um, at the Church Street intersection. And unfortunately, the volume is so high approaching the Church Street intersection, it would um, severely impact and add to the queue um, on Washington Street on that approach um instead so that is that is why that's not being shown in the concepts here tonight thanks christine uh, we have about 34 open questions in the q a so lee i think it probably makes sense to just chip away those a little bit more before returning to the hands sounds good so the next comment is from rachel or question in concept a of the southwest quadrant does the existing crosswalk at Richardson Street and Center Street continue to exist? Thanks for that question, Rachel. Um, for some of these that are about specific quadrants, I don't know if we want to take this opportunity to switch our slide back and give people another look at what Rachel's asking about. Yeah, if we can go back to that slide, I think I know what you're talking about. Um, I believe that the um coloring of the concept just went a little bit too far i don't i don't believe the intention is to get rid of that crosswalk i think it just went a little bit too far and covered the existing um at the very south i think is what we're talking about at, at richardson street excellent um and then the next question from howard i assume it was probably also about this uh concept just because they were asked really close together um, are pedestrian walkways raised over traffic? I can jump in here. Um, so, I, yeah, I just wanted to clarify by raised. Um, I, I think you, you're referring to just curbs and just, you know, being like about six inches above the roadway grade, not like a, a bridge or a tunnel or anything like that. Um, and the answer for sidewalks is yes. Typically, they'll be, you know, the six inches above placed at curb height. Um, above the roadway. Excellent. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, the next question is from Andrea. Why don't you reopen the ramp in West Newton and help Newton Corner? It was closed many years ago because the homeowners there complained. Seems like a simpler solution. You could also reopen Washington Street towards Brighton for two-way traffic. Thank you, Andrea. Um, oh, Mark, do you want to take this? Well, I was just going to say, as far as reopening the ramp in West Newton, that will be probably something looked at in the next long-term study, um, which looks at, you know, not just the focus area around Newton Corner, but again, um, all of the Newton Corridor on the Mass Turnpike. So it'll be looking at possible new uh, egresses from the Turnpike. So, and as far as um, opening up Washington Street towards Brighton and two-way traffic. Um, that would be something that um, the city would need to coordinate since it's a city roadway. And also look uh, working with the local residents that live along the section of Brighton, I mean, uh, Washington Street. Thank you, Mark. Uh, the next question is about Southwest Quadrant Alternative 1 from Patricia. What do you plan to do to make Washington Street going towards Brighton safe for pedestrians, children, pets, and the handicapped. This was specifically changed to go towards Tremont Street in order to avoid serious accidents, uh, as you know, where children were killed or permanently injured. Thank you for your question, Patricia. Um, is, is anyone able to answer this question from Patricia? Washington Street going toward Brighton.
Um, I, I think I'm a little bit confused. The Southwest quadrant is I, not where Washington street is headed towards Brighton. Um, so I think the question is a little bit confusing. Um, but if we're talking about the Southeast quadrant and headed towards Brighton, um, that is slightly outside of the scope of this, um, of this study area and the study area limits. Um, and our study area boundaries did not include Washington street past the, the one-way section. Got it. Um, and I see Patricia is still here in the attendee list. So Patricia, um, if we, if we didn't get right where you were talking about, please feel free to raise your hand and clarify or put something else in the Q and A and, and we'll get to it. Uh, for now, moving on to the Southeast quadrant, we have a question from Lauren. Uh, are we addressing the lights on Galen as you are headed toward Watertown right after getting off the bridge? The left turn people make at the first light is where a ton of traffic is generated, preventing cars from being able to move through the light off the bridge. Thank you, Lauren. The, the question had said southeast quadrant, um, but maybe in the right place, I'm not sure. Um, sorry, I need to turn on my video. Um, uh, assuming we're talking about the northeast quadrant and not the southeast quadrant right here, um, you know, while there are no geometric changes being proposed at um, those first few intersections just north um, of the quadrant, all all signals are be all signals within our study area are being looked at for signal timing changes as well. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Suzanne. Can you say more about the impact on the abutting neighborhoods of the different options, especially increased traffic on side streets? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Suzanne. Yeah, I can answer this one. Um, yeah, so all of these alternatives, um, they're designed to improve flow um, and reduce congestion through the study area. Um, ideally, um, we know this is a super congested area out there. So we know there's no like magic bullet to make congestion go away in this area. But we're trying to, to make the improvements that we can out here. Um, so ideally, with the improved flow and reduced congestion, uh, that should help to decrease cut through to local streets uh, that are avoiding the area. Great, Leah. If it's okay with you, I think we can go back to the hands. Just give all right. Give you a little uh, break. I, I just wanna, I just wanna remind something to everyone. Um, uh, at this time, we we do not have proposed improvements. We are just soliciting inputs. That's the reason we are not going to be able to answer all the questions. Some of the questions and comments are just going to be read, so everybody and documented, and we will consider when we sit down again for the next stage. Just wanted to remind everyone, we are not going to be able to answer all the questions, but we are documenting them. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Janet, I have given you uh, permission to unmute your microphone and ask your question. Well, I guess I asked the question earlier, who makes the decision? I mean, you know, so a lot of stuff gets pushed on us from, you know, the government. And I want to know who makes the final decision on this. Um, I, I don't understand exactly what you mean by final decision. However, there is a team of engineers working on the design, soliciting input from the public and making research. Once the project, we are at the early stages of the project development and there are no determinations made yet. The team will work on a design and when we come up with the preferred alternative, after we solicit the input from you, public, uh, we will come up with a preferred alternative 
and again, we will present it. And then design starts. When the design starts, we do have a design and review process. Um, that's, that's, the, that's the process. I don't know if that answers your question. I think that's good, Angie, for where we're uh, at. I, I think all I have to say is qualified engineers collect the data and a group of engineers makes the decision at the end of the day. All right, Leah, I think we're good to go back to the, the written questions that we'll go through. Thank you. All right. The next written question is from Monica, who asks, what does data tell us about roundabout caused accident frequency? Thank you, Monica. I can chime in again. Um, so I know I, I don't have any of the hard data right in front of me, but um, I know in general, like from um, an industry standard that uh, roundabouts are uh, safer than signalized intersections. Um, if you look at just like a standard um, one lane roundabout versus like a standard four way intersection. Um, and part of that is because um, it reduces the number of conflict points going through an intersection. Um, so when you're entering the roundabout, you only have a conflict point with one vehicle, the vehicle already in the roundabout. Whereas at a traditional four-way intersection, you have conflict potential conflict points with all different types of turning vehicles from every different approach approaching at once. Um, so, so I don't have any of that hard data directly in front of me, but I know um, in general, out there um, that show that roundabouts um, in general are safer than a signalized intersection. Yeah, and just to add to what Matt said, that um, it, it does reduce uh, crash frequency overall. And also the biggest thing is that it reduces um, crash severity. Um, there's typically less uh, injuries at a roundabout than there are at a signalized intersection for crashes. Thank you, Mark and Matt. The next question is from Robin. The conditions for pedestrians on the bridge are very bad, especially in inclement weather. How will these be improved in the new design? Will there be a separation barrier between the sidewalk and the road? Thank you, Robin. Um, I can jump in on this one. Uh, so uh, typically you'll at least have that curbed raised barrier uh, in between the roadway and, and the shared use path or the sidewalk. And again, because these are concept level, we didn't really like dive super into the details of like exactly what kind of separation there will be between the roadway and the path. So that's something that, um, you know, we'll continue to look at as design progresses. <clears throat> yeah, I'll just chime in too, Kristen, to piggyback on that, on the the eastbound bridge. So the ones between the southwest and the northwest quadrant um, with the shared use path, we're proposing to widen, widen that area for the heads in the bikes. So that should hopefully make it a slightly nicer environment for pedestrians and bicyclists going through there. Thank you both. Um, oh, I see a very easy question here from uh, Isaac. Can we see the next step slide again for upcoming steps? Thanks. That's uh, easy to do. While that's happening, I'll read the next question uh, from Janet. Um, Janet says, so you'll be taking land from neighbors to build what you want in our neighborhood. I think we probably already talked a little bit about how public input is going to be considered in this, but um, maybe Mark could tell us a little bit about the right-of-way process. We, we, we do not have a design yet. Yeah. The general right of way process. Oh. Absolutely. Um, the first step, you're going to receive a letter from the MassDOT uh, representative um, wanting to organize an interview, and we will go over if they have uh, impacts to the area, and then we will discuss it and give you a sketch of the impacted area. and. If um, you need to have any questions, we can answer any question that you might have um, that's on the sketch itself. And, but that's basically it. You're going to meet with one of us if there is an impact to your property. 
um, far as an easement. But other than that, um, if you had any other questions, you, you can always call us or, uh, or write us. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Um, any other panelists want to jump in on that? I will. I just want to say that, you know, we're too early in the process to really determine if we're, you know, going to have any property impacts. Um, because that's one of the things that's a major concern of us. We, we don't like impacting people's properties and our projects. Um, but it's really, really too early to determine if there's going to be any impacts at this time. Excellent. Thank you. Um, the next question is, oops, my list of questions just got a little messed up. Hold on. Oh, here we go. Uh, Janet was asking if any of the DOT people live in Newton Corner. Not sure. Um, I'm not DOT, but I will answer for VHB that um, our office is right across the river in Watertown. So a lot of us, including, including myself, travel through this area quite frequently, going to and from the office. Uh, we're right on Arsenal Street in Watertown, and I've been there for, I don't know, the last 20, 30 years. So at least all of us at VHB are very, very familiar with this area. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, the next one is from P. Gerald, or maybe Gerald. Sorry, uh, it says, I have concerns about people coming eastbound from Washington into the rotary where there is currently a yield, not expecting the new light and slamming it to car stopped at a red light. How can this be mitigated? Thank you, P. Girl. I can chime in again, too. Um, I'm assuming you're referring to uh, the northwest quadrant uh, where we were talking about the two concepts that both had a light, so becoming Washington and eastbound into the rotary. Um, so any signal that we would put in, um, we'd make sure that the signal head has appropriate visibility. So anyone like approaching coming from Washington eastbound would be able to see the signal with enough distance ahead of time to see the signal, react, think about it, and come to a complete stop. Um, so if the signal heads, say they're positioned like around the corner, maybe there'd be like a signal like as you're approaching eastbound so you can see it. Um, and as we said before, we're still in the concept phase. So none of those like specific design details have been finalized yet, but we definitely would be meeting all standards that signal heads would be visible throughout. Thank you. It looks like um, P, Gerald or Gerald just um, raised their hand. Maybe they have a, a follow-up or a clarifying question to ask. Uh, Kayla, would you be able to address that one? Uh, yep, sorry, you have um, access on mute your microphone to clarify your question if needed. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. So yes, that is the area and yes, that is the concern. Um, but I was more concerned about the cars, not the cars seeing the light, but the cars coming around the turn, not seeing the cars stopped at the light. Like how, I just like thinking far in advance, stop ahead or... Um, it's just more about the anticipation when you didn't, you never used to stop there. So if cars are queued and you're on a curve, I just want to make sure there's a, someone's thinking about an adequate way to warn people that the cars are at the light, not, not seeing the light itself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a good point. Um, I think we definitely would put like a red signal ahead or an advanced warning sign um, to make sure that uh, drivers would be familiar and definitely when the new improvements come in, we'd have signage making sure everyone's aware that there's a change in traffic pattern. So it's not just popped in one day and people aren't expecting it. Um, so we definitely would make sure that there's adequate signage so people can see both the light and the cars that are stopped. Um, so. Yeah. And that same thing goes for um, turning right onto um, Park Street. So that currently is just a continuous green arrow. And when that light is actually red for pedestrians, people don't expect it. <laughs> and so anywhere where you're talking about having a stop or a light only for when the pedestrian is present in the crosswalk, it's kind of a similar uh, concern there. Uh, just 
you think it's obvious when you put signage up or, or a light or something, but this is what's happening now, especially as an example, and other people probably could chime in about that right turn onto Park Street. Yeah, that's definitely a good point. Um, we'd also make sure that when all new signals would come in, they'd be on flash at start, um, just so people would get used to them, like throughout the system where any new signals come in. Um, and yeah, like I said, we had like the advanced warning heads um, and yeah, we'd make sure that all signals are visible and yeah, but we definitely noticed that, especially the Park Street right turn. And once we would get into the final concept, whichever concept we decide and get into the engineering, we'd make sure all site distance are visible and making sure that everyone can see everything and all appropriate signages out there. That's definitely a great comment. All right. Thank you. I'm going to go back to some uh, written Q&A. Um, let's see. Marianne uh, wants to hear about the wheelchair accessible path around the hotel. Thank you, Marianne. Um, I can chime in on this one a little bit. Uh, so any new crosswalks would have accessible curb ramps at all locations and the sidewalks would be upgraded to make sure they're accessible also. So the accessible path would be via the new sidewalks and shared use path and crosswalks that would go in with these concepts. Thank you. Um, I'm going to I'll, ask a couple more. Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll add to that. If that was in regards to the stairs at the um, hotel, that's on private property. So that would have to be something that happens with the private property. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Um, note that our uh, slide master here has switched us back to the ways to give feedback. I'll just note that, you know, we're a little bit past our end time and we've also had a significant drop in participants. So almost half are not here with us anymore. Um, so noting that we're gonna try to start to wrap up. We still have a couple questions to answer, um, but just note that if you, you know, if you have to go or you have something else uh, to tell us, you can submit comments or questions by email. Uh, Newton Corner Improvements at dot.state.ma.us. Um, and you can access the project website for um, materials from this meeting once they're posted and other information. Right. Just like we said earlier, we will extend the typical comment period for this project. Uh, so uh, we will post this recording and the presentation on the website. It will be probably uh, towards the end of next week. Uh, from there, we keep it there 10 business days for your comments and questions. I just wanted to add too that um, I think this is part of Janet's original question that I forgot earlier. Um, this is also the, the point that you can submit comments of voting neither. Um, you can tell us that you don't like either of the combinations that we presented tonight, tonight of the alternatives. So um, please submit comments. We, we'd love to hear back from the public. Thank you. All right, let's read a couple more questions. Um, Maria's question, is a team working with the Better Bus Project to coordinate needs and designs for Newton Corner? Uh, Maria, I was just texting, I mean, sending an email, uh, text back. Uh, yes, we will look into that. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, next up from Allison, why were more bus only lanes not considered? Thank you, Allison. Um, I can jump in a little bit on this one. Uh, so Newton Corner is just, I'm sure you know, just a very restricted roadway space. Um, so through all the many concepts that we looked at, we would try and accommodate transit when we could, um, but we're pretty restricted in the mid turn up 
midterm options with um, existing curb locations, existing building locations. So that did make it challenging to provide bus lanes um, in each of the quadrants. <clears throat> Thank you, Kristen. Um, Gregory asked how many cars pass through each day. And then Raymond followed up with what's the expected increase in number of vehicles that will be going through Newton Corner. Um, and Ray also pointed out that Newton is going through zoning changes right now that will increase housing density, pushing for less cars and more bikes and pedestrians. Thank you both for your questions. I can take those questions. Um, so in terms of how many vehicles pass through um, I think you mean Newton Corner as a whole each day. Um, I don't have those numbers up directly in front of me, um, but it is many thousands. Um, you know, during the peak hour, we see volumes, I'll say, on the bridges of up to, you know, 2,000 vehicles in a, in a peak hour. Um, and then in terms of, you know, accounting for future growth um, and development and additional vehicular traffic throughout the study area, um, what our study will have is in, in addition to an existing conditions, we do look at a future condition analysis that goes out about um, seven to 10 years. Um, and in that we have included kind of a general low background growth, but we have also coordinated with the city of Newton, um, as well as incorporated um, projects that are currently permitted or in the pipeline in both Watertown and um, city of Boston that are nearby as well, that would be adding additional um, volume through the study area. And all of these alternatives will be considered against those future volumes as well um, in, in, in our study area and in our, in our final study as well. So hopefully that answered those questions. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Robin who asks for a clarification on what we meant by different access points regarding the rotary. Uh, if Robin's still on, that question was asked about half an hour ago, so it may be possible that we're Oh, looks like Kristen's got an idea. Oh, I, I no, no, honestly, I don't. I, I am hoping for some clarification on this. We're not sure where she's referring to. I was going to okay. chime in. Um, it might have been on my comment earlier when I was talking about um, like the safety at roundabouts. Um, and I mentioned conflict points, but it might have been what I was talking about. I'm not sure if that was uh, the same thing. But um, but yeah, this, the conflict points, at least, is generally where like there's any opportunity for two vehicles to um, connect into each other or connect into each other. Potential for two ve vehicles to contact to have conflicts um, at an intersection. So at a roundabout, like I said, when you enter, it's just the entering vehicle and the vehicle already in the circle or at a signalized intersection. It could be someone going left through straight from all four different approaches all at once. Um, um, yeah, I think from the actual concepts, um, the amount of access points to the roundabouts, um, like I said, I'm not specifically sure what you're referring to, but um, so yeah, I won't try and answer. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, the next question is from John, who says, thank you, great presentation, good concepts. On the project website, could you please link to an example of construction impact mitigation when a final design is implemented? Newton Corner has many businesses that may be affected and mitigation of negative impacts needs to be baked into this project early. Thanks for that question and your comments, John. don't hear people jumping in to answer this. It may be because we're kind of far away from a design oh, that have construction impacts. Right, yeah, I, I mean, gonna... when we have the design, we will have them in the project website. We will have Good. the information. All right. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm going to try to prioritize questions from people who are still online. Uh, so we have one from Harry. How does traffic flow through roundabout versus a traffic signal? What is the relative capacity? Thank you, Harry. So 
So I, I think what you're getting towards is kind of what's the difference in operations between um, what we have out there today versus the roundabout. Um, what you'll see with the roundabout option is that really heavy volume flow that's headed, um, I'll say eastbound on Washington Street, especially towards the I-90 eastbound on-ramp. Um, they will have much better flow with um, less stopping um, due to the reduction in signals. Um, what you'll see is a little bit more friction on the side streets for those vehicles that now have to yield to the Washington Street flow. Um, but overall, you know, we, we're we seeing very similar operations. Um, it's just a little bit distribution of kind of where, where that queue and delay is. Cool. Thank you. Uh, and then we've got, let's see. Um, we have a question from Catherine about right-of-way impacts again. Um, at what point are the potentially impacted property owners brought in? Um, either once the plan that impacts them is adopted or now so they can be brought in to discuss when changes are possible. I um, mean, Catherine also has her hand up. So if she needs some clarification, uh, on this, we can go to her after. But I, I think I think we just need to remind everybody that uh, that, that we, this project is still in the study phase, and we did explain the right away procedure a couple of times. Uh, we will have the right away plans available when we get to the twenty five percent design stage, and uh, everybody will have a chance to uh, review them. Perfect. Thanks, Andrea. The, uh, the preliminary right away plans, I have to say. Right. Um, and Catherine, I see that a lot of your questions are actually about buses and that you have to run. So, and you've had your hand up and sorry that we may have missed that. So I'm giving you permission to unmute your microphone so that you can ask those questions. Yeah, just wondering if someone from the project team to uh, could talk about how you've been thinking about those express buses coming from uh, the Watertown uh, terminal that kind of come down Galen and then loop around and pick a lot of people up. Um, you know, some of those proposed kind of green islands uh, and some of the, the measures to kind of isolate lanes uh, from each other seem like it was thinking about cars turning radiuses and buses, um, you know, just need much more room. So just wondering if you could chat about how you thought about those buses coming through. Um Design team, do you want to take this? Uh, my my only uh, comment will be: we are still in the study phase, and we will be coordinating with the uh, Christine. Would you like to just elaborate to that <laughs> our meetings yes, absolutely, and absolutely. whatnot? Absolutely. So this is still um, conceptual level design at this point. Um, once we got to a more formal design process, um, what's called vehicle tracking will be done um, for all of these intersections um, to ensure that the largest anticipated vehicle size can make these turns appropriately. Um, and I'll just jump in and just add that, you know, again, very preliminarily, we did run some vehicle tracking turns already on these concepts to just give a broad sense for how big we think the lanes will need to be. But like Christine said, at once design actually gets progressed, that'll be fine-tuned um, and narrowed or widened as needed to accommodate, like she said, the biggest vehicle that we think will need to go through the intersections. Which we'll, I just want to add that will typically be bigger than a MBHTA bus as well. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to a question from Lauren, a uh, follow-up. Uh, I don't think my question was answered appropriately. I'm specifically seeking a response to traffic, uh, the traffic where you can go left to 90 West, left to Washington, or straight to Watertown. The very first light when you hit, if you decide to go straight toward Watertown, is the area I was mentioning. I believe this traffic pattern was being addressed by the Southeast Quadrant proposal. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah, just looking back at the original question, I think it says the Southeast Quadrant, are we addressing the lights on Galen as you are heading to toward Watertown, right um, after getting off the bridge? <laughs> yes, and when I, I believe I answered that last time, um, and when I answered, I actually was talking about the Northeast Quadrant, um, understanding that you probably meant the intersections of Pearl at Jefferson, just north um, of the of the Newton Corner interchange, um, and 
I'll reiterate what I said before, you know, although there are no specific geometric changes proposed there, all intersections are being evaluated for signal timing adjustments that could benefit, um, that operations could benefit from. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Richard. Will cars coming southerly up from Charles Bank Road into a rotary be able to go halfway around and then head east towards Brighton without going around the entire river? Oh boy, entire rotary like they do now. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, I can chime in here. Um, so that's back in the southeast quadrant. So um, under the two signalized options that we showed, um, people coming on Charles Bank, uh, St. James Street, I think it's the same, coming in would have to do the same configuration as they do now to go all the way around. But under the two uh, roundabout concepts that we showed, um, both of those would allow cars coming from St. James to kind of like reverse direction at uh, the roundabout and then go on to Park Street heading towards Brighton. So they wouldn't have to go all the way around uh, all of Newton Corner like they do today. Um, I think we have that on the slide if we want to pull it back up just to... So what I'm talking about, um, yeah, this one here, you can see um, if you're coming down St. James, um, you'd be able to, yeah, go down, yeah, reverse direction there and go down to Park Street. And that'd be the same, and that would be allowed under both of the two roundabout concepts, B1 um, and B2. Um, and then, yep, also you'd be able to go um, around the roundabout all the way to head onto the I-90 eastbound ramp. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we have, looks like four more questions in the Q&A, uh, about 30 members of the public still here, um, and we're getting towards 8.30, so I think we're going to go for around an 8.30 stop, um, but I'll get to these questions that are already in my queue. So the next one's from Ginny. Could you please evaluate the various options for accessibility? especially for pedestrians with both visual and mobility disabilities going forward. Uh, also, will the shared use paths have a white cane detectable separation between the bike lane and sidewalk for pedestrians? Thank you for that question, Ginny. Um, I can jump in. Um, so yes, absolutely. You know, as design progresses, accessibility is is always considered and will continue to be considered. And um, in terms of, you know, what kind of space we have available along the shared use path or the sidewalks, um, that'll be another final design detail. Uh, again, it's a, a little hard to tell at this level exactly how much space we will have, um, but for sure that will be considered. Thanks. Great. Uh, the next question is from Alina. At this time, the express bus route has eliminated a direct route to the financial center, making an earlier exit to the Copley Place exit. Is there any way we can apply some pressure on the MBTA to bring back the original routes pre-COVID? Thank you, Alina. Um. I guess answer to this question or comment is thank you for your comment. We will consider. We, we will look into it. Sounds good. Uh, the next question is from Janet. Is a I-90 off-ramp in Alston near Leo J. Birmingham Parkway still being considered uh, offloading some of the runoff uh, of our neighborhood? Thank you, Janet. That um, that potential off ramp in Alston is not being considered specifically as part of this project, um, as this focuses really on narrowly the the Newton Corner study area, but is something that will likely be considered as part of the long term study that will be kicking off soon. Excellent, thank you. And our last question from uh, City Councilor Maria Greenberg: Did I hear you correctly that the signal equipment? in the rotary will be updated in 2024 prior to any design and project build out. Thank you for that question. I'll answer that. Um, 
Yes, we're working with the city and uh, so VHB to come up with some um, short-term improvements and short-term improvements meaning 2024. And part of that will be um, updating all the signal equipment to bring it up to date, um, not only with uh, new signal controllers, but also uh, video detection units and video monitoring units. So we'll be able to monitor um, some of the traffic ongoing as opposed to today where a lot of it's just running pre-timed on the <clears throat> with no detection. So yeah, that's it's in the process right now. Great. Thank you everyone for all of your questions and feedback. And I will turn it back to Moazos to close out this meeting. All right. Thank you so much. Um so we have the how how to reach a slide up. Your feedback is very important to the success of the project. In addition to providing feedback during this meeting, we encourage you to reach out to us with written comments, emailing us at the address shown above, shown on the screen is preferred. As we repeated earlier, we will extend the typical comment period for this project. We encourage you to provide any additional comments within 10 business days of the video of this presentation being posted on the MassDOT website. Project website and the QR code is on the screen. Please add project number 609288 in the subject line of your email. This concludes our workshop today on the signal and safety improvements at Interchange 127 Newton Corner project. We thank you for joining us tonight. And again, your comments, feedback are always appreciated. Good night.